So welcome everybody to today's machine gun coffee seminar after all of the technical difficulties at all we are in the computer science. Yeah, field. they always say all that. Technology yeah. Anyway, so I'm really happy to introduce uh, Justin Van der Holt, um, who's an assistant professor of computational metabolomics in the biomedics group in Wahen University. Um, he obtained his PhD in 2012. Um, at the Bioscience Group in Wyoming. Um, and after a postdoctoral period in Glasgow, where he was studying both analytical and computational aspects of metabolite structure and patient in the country, Wyoming, where he's now heading his own research team, level levels uh, computational metabolites, metabolites to find novel finite metabolites and interpret source and function. So in today's talk, we are going to hear about the use of machine learning computational metabolomics workflows to tackle chemical structure annotation, smart, smart spectrometry data and natural product discovery. And before I put the floor to Justin, I mentioned that tomorrow, Justin will like as the opponent of the PhD uh, thesis of Eric Bach. Uh, and this will take place at noon in the undergraduate center room uh, in dream. So everybody welcome there as well. And now, without further ado, uh, what was yours? Well, thank you so much for your warm welcome. And um, yeah, I also look forward to tomorrow. It will be a very interesting experience for both of us. So um, yeah, but today let's focus on the, on the, on the talk that I prepared. So um, I realize you are of various backgrounds. Um, so uh, I, uh, I will try to introduce the topics uh, as well as I can, but if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stick up your hand and just uh, make sure that we all understand what we talk about. I prefer that than to finishing uh, or wrapping off all my slides. So uh, I will just take a look at the time every so often to see how we're doing, but let me know uh, if I need to round off, uh, Marcus. Yeah? So it's a really long title, but it kind of covers the, the various topics in the lab. So uh, we, uh, we, our focus is to develop computational metabolomics workflows. We do use machine learning for that. We also use other approaches. And our focus is on mass spectrometry data and natural products discovery. So you can see a range a suite of tools that, that my group has been involved in, some of them I was actually involved in before I uh, I had my own group in Wageningen, and like MSTL8 was founded in uh, in Glasgow together with Simon Rogers, who some of you might may also uh, know because I think he he had been here. He's been here for for a little while as well. So um, yeah, most of the work is published. So feel free to take a picture or look it up directly uh, on on the internet. Um, and if you want to follow my group or myself to get more updates. Uh, we are still on Twitter um, and also on LinkedIn, you can find me. Um, so let's see if this works. No. Okay, so this is my group. So I have to, of course, uh, as you realize, once you start to become PI, then pretty soon you no longer have time to do the research yourself. So this is my amazing team now. Um, and uh, actually um, the work for today will be mainly done by Kevin on the left, uh, uh, Micha, uh, the postdoc in, our, in my lab, and also in Marnik Medina's lab, and by Nick de Jonge, uh, the PhD student who dared to be my first PhD student. So, uh, but he, uh, he is uh, very well up to the task uh, so far, at least. So if you want to know more, we also have um, a website. So. so I wanted to start with kind of summarizing what we're doing. So you have a broad idea of, of, of how things are going. So basically, and also it kind of shows my own route in academia. So I started grinding tea leaves and stuff like that, right? Preparing the samples, putting them into the mass spectrometer, uh, get, getting workflows running to not only measure the molecules, but also fragment them. So um, what happens there is that you basically start with your complete molecule, but then you, you break it up. Um, but it's not as simple as I say now, because in the mass spec, uh, the molecules get ionized, and then uh, we don't really understand yet how exactly they break up. That's the main problem we have. If we would have, then I wouldn't be here today. I would have done something different probably, but we don't yet. So there is still room for all the way 
uh, from the machine learning part over there, like uh, we can use topic modeling approaches or embedding based approaches to start to organize, structure the data, understand what came in. And then of course, the whole analysis pipeline will then hopefully help to kind of get an idea of what the molecules are that were in the, in the, in the extracts and in the end, what they are doing, okay? So, and basically, uh, uh, most of the work we're doing, it starts with chemical extracts. You get this uh, rather information dense metabolomics profiles with a lot of spectra that you then want to start to understand. And um, I'm hopeful that some of you at least have heard of, of kind of approaches to do spectral similarity. I know that the US group is at least working on that as well. So you want to connect related metabolites based on their spectra. Right. If we can do that, then we can start to understand which spectra belong together, which spectra the molecules uh, behind those spectra are related to each other. And also we can start to build molecular families of related metabolites. So, but that's all nice. However, in practice, most people are interested in which samples are important or relevant to them. For example, if you do a screening for uh, antibi new, novel antibiotics, you're most interested in the samples that contain uh, bioactive compounds against your uh, fungus, for example. And then not only that, you're also interested in which compounds are actually the ones that are relevant to, to use in your uh, assay then and to, to uh, work on for further discovery. So what often starts with a simple question, because say that that we know that we are interested in these two molecules, then we of course want to know who is making them in the sample because often if you take an extract from the soil here outside, if you can dig into it still here, then you will find a lot of microbes and uh, also a lot of molecules, but then still you don't know who is producing uh, uh, the molecules. And also uh, it's interesting to know what they are doing, right? Do they make the plants living here sad or happy? And yeah, what did they do to us? But in biology, it's never as simple. So uh, we see this, we see those structures, we see the spectra. We can start to recognize patterns. I will get back to that, but we don't see the structures. So the first question is always, what is there? Then you can ask who is producing it. And only then we can really start to answer the, I think most interesting question, what is actually doing? So, uh, most of my work is inspired by nature, not only because the samples come from there, but also uh, nature, uh, um, it, it contains a lot of patterns. Uh, and, and basically, uh, most people in my group are pattern miners, so to speak. And I also, uh, I'm also considering myself as one. And actually, humans have been pattern miners for, for ages, centuries. This church, they started building this uh, slightly after the year 1000 in the Czech Republic. And you can see that in the roof of the church, at least I see very natural patterns there in the form of flowers. So um, yeah, humans have been inspired by nature and by the patterns in there for, for, uh, for centuries. And we are still uh, inspired by them and want to find them back using uh, novel approaches. So why all that? Well, because nature, as you may know, produce a lot of really interesting molecules. Yeah, they, um, so of some we know what they're doing in their natural habitat, of some we don't, but even then we were able to hijack them and to exploit them in, in various different applications as you have by now will have seen from the slide. So the big challenge we have is to link our data, the increasing amount of mass spec data, spectra, to these molecules, and then especially the larger molecules, because they are still quite difficult to catch. The, you mean not the spectra necessarily, but to link with the structures and what they are doing. So my research vision is to really close the gap between what we can see in metabolomics, so all the spectra, and what we can actually learn from it. So we have uh, different pillars, three research pillars. So one is machine learning to read metabolite structure from spectra. Today, you will see some of that, of course. Um, also, I would like to pursue more into the direction of chemically informed comparative metabolomics to prioritize chemistry. You will also see a bit of that today. And 
given time, I may also shortly comment on how we can link metabolomics to other uh, data types, such as genomics, uh, to gain uh, more functional insight. So, but first let's do a short promo uh, talk on, on why we are here now together, because I think Antarctic metabolomics is really on the rise. We see a lot of methods recently being, being published, especially uh, for to better understand untargeted metabolomics data. And why is that? Well, the instrumentation got much more sensitive and faster, so we can measure more basically in the same extract. The generic extraction protocols become much more feasible, which is nice. But also, all the higher throughput and fractionation robots, huh? they, they are really getting installed everywhere now, and which also uh, speeds up the whole process. So this is kind of what happens if you would put the target metabolomics in PubMed, uh, at least some months ago. However, we can also see a race in computational metabolomics. Huh? And that's not unsurprisingly, because um, if you realize that the data becomes more and more dense, then we really need the support from computational tools to understand, to, to still be able to understand what we are looking at. And this is only looking for computational metabolomics, not even for computational mass spectrometry or other variants of the same thing, so. Um, oh yeah, and one fun fact is that that uh, uh, this is when I started to study. Uh, the, uh, I think this is where I got my uh, PhD. So uh, I still had to do a, a lot of manual work, I'm afraid, in understanding my own data. But uh, if I would have restarted my PhD now, then you can see that there's much more uh, help. Um, yeah, some examples from what we're doing. So um, Kevin Mildau, he is a PhD student that I co-supervise. He's currently in, uh, in Vienna. And um, basically, one of his first project was to uh, develop a tool uh, that is now called homolog discoverer to discover uh, wanted and or unwanted polymer series in mass spectrometry data. And for this, we used uh, a more uh, a simple heuristic recursive function approach uh, to really be able to, yeah, in many cases, uh, facilitate data cleaning of the noise polymers, because as you, some of you may know, mass spectrometry data is very rich data, but also very rich of noise. So, and not only thermal noise, electronic noise, but also yeah, uh, polymeric uh, noise from plasticizers used uh, and or from the column bleeding. So, uh, and this tool uh, really helps with that um, because the idea is to group these polymers uh, uh, together and then you can, you can actually treat them as such rather than the individual disconnected peaks. And this is an example of the visualization that Kevin uh, developed. So this is the entire data set and in colors, you see the various polymer series uh, discovered by homolog discoverer, uh, you are able to extract it in a peak list. So and then you can decide whether or not to keep those peaks in your uh, analysis results or not. And this was uh, recently published in uh, in bioinformatics. If you are more interested in this, or if you think you can use this as a way to clean up your own data. So once we have cleaned the data, right? Then we have the peaks left that we actually need to do something with, and yeah, how do we make sense of this uh, large scale data sets? Yeah, um, the first thing to do, in my opinion at least, is to do library matching. Yeah? So uh, before anything else, you, you go out to your own maybe in-house library, but hopefully you already uploaded all that data into the public library. So uh, you go to the public libraries, you try to match what you have to what is there. Yeah? And then you, uh, yeah, you're hoping for an exact match uh, which means that you can restrict your, your search window a lot. So not so many comparisons and computations for that. It answers the question, which molecules are in my sample? The other way to do it is to do a so-called analog search. There we do a more loose match, uh, which means many more comparison computations, but it answers the question, how do the molecules in my data, in my sample, relate to the library spectra? If you have something that looks like something in the library, you hope to pick it up here. Yeah? And um, oops. what we typically then uh, would like to see is, is a high accuracy in, in, in this matching process. And of course, as fast as possible. So we can continue uh, our uh, real, real interest in um, analysis of what is it all doing and what does it all mean? So 
And one uh, approach we introduced uh, not too long ago in uh, 2021, it was published, is uh, uh, spec to vec It's based on uh, word to vec and based on an embedding-based uh, uh, approach. So I will do one uh, disclaimer. I'm not a machine learner by, by origin, so uh, feel free to correct my language. I'm, I'm not at all embarrassed by that, uh, but I, I do my best to explain what happened anyway. Um, so um, we uh, kind of took over the approach uh, from word to fact, but rather than the words, we have seen two examples here. And I guess I, I don't need to explain too much about this to you guys, but uh, we took uh, two sentences here. And unless you're from Italy, I hope you agree that they kind of mean the same thing. Yeah, so we can see the correspondence between the words. And um, if we go to uh, the metabolomic side, uh, um, the um, the sentences become the, the spectra and the words become the fragments we uh, we measure. So, um, and then of course, uh, we, we would hope that the approach, the embedding would learn the relationships between the various fragments, right? So, and that's the difference with, uh, with the non-machine learning approaches uh, where um, we typically bin the fragments and then see uh, if there's a correspondence in the bins, now what we would hope is that we would also be able to look across the different bins, right? To see the relationships that those uh, cosine, often cosine or normalized dot product based comparisons cannot see. So if we would then uh, uh, look at it from a, a, a further distance, yeah, we have the vocabulary of the words in this case, and we can create dimensions. So in this case, I made them up. So positive affection, hot rings, and then we can account the, the various contributions of our words to those dimensions. Of course, in practice, the computer learns this. So you have just simply dimension one, dimension two, and different numbers, of course, um, but the ID uh, is still the same. And then when we go to spec to vec of course, uh, our vocabulary is much larger with uh, thousands of different fragments and losses. And we also have many more dimensions. Uh, in our case at the moment, 300. So, and we can use that embedding then to embed the various uh, spectra. And um, so spectrum one and spectrum two here. And the idea is then in, in our case, what we wanted to do is spectral similarity using this new embedding. So our application is mass spectral similarity scoring. And in our paper, we show that compared to the cosine based scoring, the black line, uh, the uh, spectral vec based approach offered, uh, yeah, across the whole board, a more accuracy. Uh, so, and we have to read it as follows that uh, this is the accuracy, the, so the percentage of correct hits. And on the uh, x axis, the retrieval, so the hits that you can back per query spectrum. So that means that over here, we have a very uh, strict threshold. And then if we move along the x-axis, our threshold becomes lower and lower, yeah? So it makes sense that, that we get higher accuracies on the left-hand side of the plot. So, um, and it also shows that uh, uh, only looking at the fragments that directly correspond does not always suffice to get correct hits or good hits. So another nice thing that we looked at was this so-called analog search. As I explained, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the uh, drawbacks of analog search is that you really need to do a lot of comparisons. So, uh, but here, since we already calculated or trained the embedding, uh, the actual uh, retrieval of the nearest candidate is very quickly, and that means that you can use this as a as a kind of fast way to do the analog search. And actually especially for the larger masses, we got also very decent results back because, yeah, you can see it. So over here, we can see that for the, uh, as of mass 400 to 2000, we can see that if we do this analog search that uh, most of the time we get a very decent, similar looking molecule returned uh, from uh, spec to vec uh, scoring because the tiny motor score, and I will go back to this, is, is uh, in, a, in a decent uh, uh, ballpark. So um, we also introduced 
because uh, so far this is all unsupervised. So we don't really give any input on what actually goes in. We also developed it's, I would say, supervised cousin, but I'm not sure if you would agree. Uh, so it's a supervised based uh, alternative where we used this uh, Siamese neural network. And what it does is it actually, um, it, uh, we trained it to learn uh, the tiny motor score between uh, two structures based on the spectra. So the advantage is, is that you would hope it, it is even more accurate than SpectraVac, uh, but the disadvantage is that you need good training data, right? So for SpectraVac, we can use any spectrum without annotations. For MS Deep Score, we need training data with spectral structural combinations. Um, so the bottom line is that it works decently for, uh, for spectra that look like those in the training set. Um, and it works less well for those that are not in there. Um, however, we are still thinking about ways to further improve this. And actually, if we do a test for the analog search in this case, we can see the red, li the red line, that is the line of MS2 deep score. And actually, again, we have the, the recall going up here and the precision uh, on, on the y-axis. And what we can see is that across the whole ballpark, again, and now we see that MSU deep score is actually offering uh, a, a larger precision. So, um, but as I said, I wanted to, uh, and I want to emphasize that we, we used uh, spectra. Uh, we, we did, uh, it was structured as joint, but we did use spectra that are similar, at least in terms of chemistry and, and spectral features, quite similar to those that are in the, in the training data, so. Okay, now I already introduced quite a couple of tools and things. And I think one of the major issues that users have nowadays is that there are so many different tools and settings that each then can come up with different results. And um, we recently published a, a paper, a perspective review in metabolomics, uh, that is also part of the whole topics in metabolomics discussion that is will be held in two weeks. Um, and yeah, there we show how nowadays eh, there, there's various strategies to, to uh, go from spectra to structures. And basically most of our work, including yours, is, is on this end eh, where, we, where we take an in-between step and then see which structure is the uh, is the best one fitting to the to the spectra? But we also see some recent examples where people take on the challenge to directly predict structures uh, from the spectra, uh, often also using uh, uh, deep learning. So, at the moment, I would say I would say that the direct strategy is promising, but not yet delivering the same accuracy. So, I still put my money on 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 the two step uh, kind of uh, approach. Uh, but I think that that over time, when there's sufficient training, good training data, yeah, we have seen with AlphaFold for the protein structure to deep prediction that that what can happen then. So I'm really looking forward to to see, yeah, in a few years how those approaches will uh, will perform. So, but so far we have to do with what we have, right? And and that is also acknowledging there's a lot of heterogeneity in this data, in the training data, and also biases. So. Uh, on top, you see uh, this uh, pi kind of circle diagrams for uh, the GPS public spectral data available. GPS is uh, uh, a um, platform organized by UC San Diego, Peter Dorsen's group, and they collect uh, uh, the various public spectral libraries from across the world and from users. And you can see that uh, some compound classes are really, really abundant and others are much less so. Also, if you look at instrument types, you have the same situation. So yeah, we probably need to be aware of that and, and also take that into account when we start to train our uh, machine learning models. Another thing to, to, to look at is that uh, um, the orange distribution here are all the spectra uh, with uh, smiles. So we can actually use to, to, for machine learning training. Uh, and this are the pair of masses. So you see there's a whole bump at the lower end, and then it kind of trickles off. Then we have the purple one. That is the one that are there, but they don't have smiles. So I have an annotation, but I don't have the means to actually use them for training because we cannot machine read the structure. 
And then we have a sample distribution here in blue. And basically what I want to show is that these three distributions are completely different, right? So that means that if we want to, to develop methods, well, we need to do a couple of things to enrich, uh, to enrich the libraries, uh, but, but especially at the, at the, at for the larger molecules and also uh, be able to more effectively use all those manual annotations that are there, but are not there yet in a machine readable format. Yeah. Crucible, yeah. So this is experimental data from uh, bacterial data in this case. Yeah, yeah. So you can see how that, yeah. And you can see, especially here in the middle, uh, uh, where there is the, the most, we have the, the least training available, yeah, so. Yeah, so, and then we continue also to show that some stratified testing and, and training uh, can also be good to do at a regular base for your new approach, because we can observe that, that there are differences in how well the uh, tools um, kind of um, work at the various different uh, um, certified tests. So, and of course, but I think that is, it, it is, it makes sense, but we see that if we use a more uh, a test spectra, then our errors get uh, uh, smaller. However, and I think that's good to realize, uh, you still need to be able to have so many uh, uh, test spectra available, so. Um, yeah, so what is the solution to this kind of problem is to make sure that you have ways to um, uh, define the optimal approaches in, a, in an educated way rather than just using default as many people do. Um, have a way to explore kind of your data set, assess the options, and then decide on what is best for your problem. And of course, it would also be nice to spike in a known substance library to help you to assess the settings and, and make the proper annotations. So that's what we're also doing with Kevin. So this is really work in progress. So non, not, not published yet. We hope to, to at least get a preprint out this year. Um, so this is an example of a plot that, that we are thinking of. So uh, it shows uh, here in, in from blue to yellow MSO deep score similarity score. So the supervised uh, approach to learn spectral similarity uh, on, uh, on, a, on a set of uh, a library spectra in this case measured, uh, um, I think in Vienna. And uh, these are all flavonoids. And then we can see from this plot that MSO deep score recognizes a number of clusters in there based on their spectra. But we can also see that the other tools used, so SpectraVac and the modified cosine score, they hardly show any hits for this spectra above a decent threshold. Um, in other words, uh, we can already observe that for this compound, it makes a lot of sense to rely on the MSO deep score similarity scores. Yeah? Um, and then the other thing that we are thinking of is to, yeah, how can we explore the whole data set in a bit more uh, um, intuitive way? is to uh, present uh, um, &E, uh, 2D TSNE of this MSO deep score uh, embedding. And then we can see all the spectra and where they are. And then we also want to do some uh, uh, clustering based on uh, the MSO deep score embedding. And then uh, also present these clusters uh, in the hope that we cluster uh, the sim similar chemistries together based on the spectra. And uh, another thing is then what we want to uh, show and let the user play with is like, if you put the threshold for networking on 0.9 in this case, then you can see which uh, spectra and groups of spectra are connected, right? And you can see, well, hopefully uh, you can see that there's here a very dense network that we also enlarged here. And here there's a couple of connections in there. And if you now start to lower the threshold, to 0 0.8, then you see that the whole, the whole picture changes, right? There are many, many more connections. This is even more stronger over here, but some other areas are still hardly touched. Then if we uh, increase to go down, we see suddenly a real boom, 
Um, and then, of course, if you start to continue to go down, then at some point, everything will be connected. So in other words, uh, uh, this exploration, and I will repeat it, from open A to open 7.5 to open 7, if we can start to do this, and we can also use some spike in components to reason out what, what, is, what, what, what is chemically meaningful and not, then we can really start to also use, uh, I think, in my opinion, more meaningful uh, thresholds. So in the final part of the talk, I will uh, uh, briefly introduce um, um, Fermo. And uh, that is a tool that kind of tries to answer the question I asked at the beginning, what type of, um, so which sample is most important and which features are most relevant? And so we start with natural researches, resources. Um, many groups, they have uh, some sort of bioactivity assay that they can do, let's say that returns to some active inactive score or some percentage of activity. And then we get molecules out, like these two except known examples. Um, and often that is also the case, right? We often get this low hanging fruits uh, out of these uh, approaches because those are the obvious examples or the most uh, abundant uh, molecules in the data. Uh, therefore, we have this alternative route using LCMSMS data that we have just already seen how that kind of works. Um, however, there is a problem of missing compatibility, right? We have many, many different tools. So some do the peak picking like MSM mine, some do annotation like GPS, MSQLDA, uh, some you can use for annotation like Lotus, which is a database full of uh, natural products and their taxonomies. Um, and some can do the pathway analysis and the more statistical approach like a metabol analyst. So uh, let's call Infermo, and this is all work by uh, Mitya Saduk and it's available as a preprint. Um, so what we now have is a dashboard application that can take in the raw data, the bioactivity assays, and some metadata. It does then do the automatic data linking and the annotation. We do metric calculation and scoring, uh, for example, novelty scoring, bioactivity scoring, and then you get a dashboard where you can actually visualize it and, and start to do the interpretation. So FERMO, a formulation of metrics for reproducible metabolomics objects. And FERMO also means firm in uh, Italian. So we have, the, uh, we have uh, constructed a novelty metric, a diversity metric, convoluteness. That is, if you want to start to isolate the molecule, the, the, le the, least, or the less convoluted it is, the better, of course, and bioactivity. So bioactivity, makes sense, often you want to find something bioactive. Novelty can be important, especially if you're a company because on novel molecules, it's much easier to, uh, to do a patent and to get something out than on something that is already known. Yeah, I will get into that. Yeah, but very briefly because of time, I think, uh, I don't know, T tell me when to shut up, yeah? Um, so, uh, uh, this is, uh, these are some examples from, from the dashboard view. Um, so, uh, basically we try to make it intuitive and that you can still explore most of the things. Uh, let me highlight our pseudo chromatogram view. So this is the data read in from the peak table in this case from, uh, MZ mine. So we don't use the raw data, but we use the information in the peak table to redraw the chromatogram, and I think it looks still pretty good if you compare it to the actual raw data. In the preprint, we included some examples where you can also see that with your own eyes. All these colors are related to the various uh, groupings and thresholds based on, for example, bioactivity scoring or novelty scoring or presence absence in groups. And uh, let me show you how that then helps, right? Because how do we then prioritize uh, features and samples? Well, uh, uh, this is a, an example from data that Micha uh, obtained earlier during his PhD. So we start with more than 140 different features. Um, and then we slowly go down and down and down to, uh, in the end, only three left that can be actually uh, putatively responsible for the activity. Yeah? And the way to do that is to 
remove everything that is associated to the blank because it cannot be biological uh, data. Um, and uh, also uh, to remove everything uh, that is not correlated to or not detected in uh, the uh, correlated to the bioactivity or detected in the active samples. So, uh, and you can see how that then quickly goes down to three and three is of course a much better number to then uh, manually validate than 143. So, um, this is a detailed view of one of the networks that are drawn based on mass spectral similarity for which we use the, the MetsMS packets also developed uh, uh, in my group. So you can uh, use that to do all sorts of comparisons and also some networking. Um, and here's the chromatograph review. And you asked about novelty. Yeah? So we have this uh, novelty score here. Um, and then uh, the, the last tool uh, I will introduce uh, is uh, ms 2 query And that is how we get our, or that's for which we rely on part of our novelty score. So we do library matching and you can also include your own library. And if you have a good library match, it means that the novelty score is very low because it is already known. Um, but we also use analog search and for that we rely on MS2 query. So this is the case, typical case, but you only do library matching. And basically when you start to do analog search, you are more likely to see something like this, right? But you also see the analogs. And I already discussed a little bit of the challenges there. So we can expect different mass differences. We don't know a priori what to expect. The number of comparisons uh, decreases uh, uh, substantially when we, uh, uh, when we have no free selection uh, as we can do with library matching. And uh, yeah, also the spectra are often very di different in terms of how they, uh, how they are built up and their relative intensity. So, um, well, there comes in MS2 query. So this is a, a work probably done by Nick de Jonge, my PhD student. It's also already available uh, on BioArchive and on GitHub. And basically um, uh, what we did uh, show is that if we use a combination of MS2 deep score, SpectruVac uh, and smart library search, then uh, we can see that um, uh, across the board. So here we go. Uh, from 100% recall back to zero. So keep in mind, uh, 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 here we have the most strict uh, thresholds. Then we see that uh, across the board, MS2 query uh, gets back uh, uh, a much higher uh, average telemotor score for the queries we do. Means that the effect of uh, analog search, the analogs that we find are also of, of higher quality. So, and this is the result of a 20 fold uh, K, sorry, 20 fold K fold uh, cross, -validation, cross validation um because we recently uh, updated uh, some of the plots following the reviewer uh, comments. So also you can see that, yeah, the impact of the test set is there, but it's not as big as the variation, uh, sorry, as the difference uh, we see between the various methods. One interesting thing to know or to show is that at the end, at the lower recall, we see this yeah, widening in, 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 uh, in the variability. And that is partly due to the fact that the number of examples, like the number of really good matches is pretty slim, right? So by chance, if you go into the data and you find uh, an, an analog, a random analog, it will have a very low uh, uh, tiny motor score, right? So this is the lowest here, but it will be much, it will be even lower than that. So um, that's obviously also something we still need to work on. How can we uh, get a better balanced uh, training set without losing a lot of data? Yeah. So and now I will just uh, go to the end. Yeah. Here, this 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 is I think nice to share with you as well. So. What I would like to go to is this, right? Where we very, very quickly can recognize groups, metabolite groups from the data that are related to, well, structures. Yeah? And, and you've seen examples of how at least I started to do that. And you can also think of the work or ms 2 lda unsupervised substructure discovery, if you are familiar with that, but also similar biological processes, pathways, and, and bio transformation. So I really hope that we will be able in not 
the too far distant future to save that kind of annotations uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the group base so that the next time you come with new data, you don't need to do a lot of uh, grouping and networking again, but you rather just put it in the tool and get out all the already known annotations. So that, that's the dream, right? And of course, I, yeah, I don't know how effective the call is here, but yeah, uh, sharing is caring. Yeah, uh, the more uh, known spectral structural combinations we have in the libraries, the better we can make the tools. But that is also true for, for yourself. So share your smiles and, and your spectra. And then, yeah, um, I also like to try to make the work uh, more appealing to students and, and colleagues. So uh, and one way that we did that is together with the Wonder team in Wageningen, we developed this 3D kind of world for the uh, spectral embedding. So this is a spectral vac embedding um, and each dot is a molecule a spectra and, and it has the metadata and, and the students can now wander through this 3D embedding and, and uh, hoover over the different points and yeah, they hopefully conclude after the, the module that indeed the computer can learn already a bit of chemistry because similar compound classes are clustered together. Each color is here a, a compound class. And they they start to appreciate also how difficult it is to, to do this uh, annotation work. So yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention. This is a, kind of a summary picture of all the work we're doing in my group uh, uh, that uh, Eleonora Negro made uh, last year. And uh, you can even recognize uh, some of the some of the slides back. Um, so, um, and if you want to know more about the different research lines and what we're doing, feel free to visit the website. And uh, thanks. And of course, uh, happy to answer more questions. So, Connelly, yeah. Who is mm -hmm. Sorry, how, what is there? So you had one of the questions in fact Ah yeah yeah. How, how the, yeah. For example, in the soil, like there are Yeah. So I will show this slide anyway then because this is kind of uh, leading to the answer. So here we have molecules or spectra, and then you need to annotate them, and then we have the various microbes. So we want to do this, right? Um, so one way we are working on is through the genome. Yeah? So many, we have many sequence genomes available and, and more and more will come. So say that we have them. Then uh, Mining Smedema's group is leading group in genome mining. So they develop tools like Anti-Smash and Bigscape. And those are recognizing so-called biosynthetic hotspots in, in the uh, sequence genomes. So based on uh, the core biosynthetic gene, um, uh, genetic machinery, they recognize, ah, in this stretch of genes, a molecule is made or can be made, right? So, and once we know that, uh, we can compare all those uh, uh, genetic groups uh, across the various organisms and also match those that are very similar because they are likely to make very similar products, okay? Yeah, and then the final step is to find the smart ways to connect that information back to the metabolomic side, yeah, where we also we can measure uh, the data for, let's say, uh, 145 um, uh, bacteria. And, oh yeah, sorry. And, yeah, so this is then a ways to link the molecule to the producer, yeah, to the genome. And, uh-oh. Did we lose connection? <laughs> 